Uh, all right, should we get started? Yes. Hey, gang, how you guys doing? Good, 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 good. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, just the upcoming vacation for everybody. Hooray. And uh, Lord, I just pray keep everybody safe and bring everybody back safe. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen? Amen. So, uh, yeah, it feels like I haven't been here in a while. I haven't been here in a while. It's great to see everybody. I'm going to give a shout out to all the ladies of Anchor House who looked amazing at the women's Christmas brunch. Also, the gals that sang at the Christmas brunch, you guys were great. Like, I was actually pleasantly surprised, a little blown away, and I was like, wow, you guys are, like, actually really good, you know? Like, it was, it was great. You guys were great. And then it made me realize once again what I said, I think, last time I was here. Yeah, we're going to miss you guys when you're gone, even over Christmas. It's kind of like you, all you Anchor House people are kind of like... Intertwining, yeah, like infecting KCF. How's that? Yeah, infecting us, yeah. And now we kind of like expect you to be around and like you're part of the scenery, so to speak. So, so yeah, well, it's like family, but that sounds so cheesy. But yeah, you're right, family. No, you guys are great. You guys are really great. Okay, so let's we got to review a little bit because we're picking up the from the book of Luke. And so last time we got together, it was interesting because um, a sinful woman, a woman, anoints Jesus' feet. So a sinful woman crashes the dinner party of a so-called righteous Pharisee. And we get a great lesson from Jesus about what type of people will be giving, given entry to the wedding feast in heaven. And namely, it goes back to his earlier teaching on the poor in spirit. So um, a couple things that happen. Again, he shows himself to be the great prophet because he, he shows that he actually knows what Simon the Pharisee is thinking. He also, again, shows that he has the power to forgive sins um, because, remember, he says, your sins are forgiven, and everybody probably goes, oh, oh my, what, whatever. And then the last line in last week's teaching, or God, two weeks ago, however long it's been, uh, is verse 50, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in <coughs> peace. peace. Yeah, I just seeing if anybody's listening. No, I heard a great sermon last week on peace. Uh, it's just really good. <laughs> seeing if anybody's paying attention is all. Yeah, I know, I know nobody was there. Yeah, that was, a, that was a joke. I preached on peace, whatever. Whatever. By the way, you know, Martin Luther, I don't know if you know this, uh, the start of the Reformation started because the Catholic Church had um, kind of uh, faded back into works righteousness. In other words, you gained entry into heaven based on what you did. Or even, you, did you know that right before Martin Luther started the Reformation, actually Martin Luther didn't start the Reformation, but right before when all that was going on, did you know the Catholic Church had a way that you could pay money to have your sins forgiven? And so they were going around collecting money, and they would actually figure out, based on how much money you were worth and how bad a sinner you were, how much you had to pay to get into heaven. Isn't that nuts? And Martin Luther's uh, one of the guys that kind of put an end to all that, and I'm surprised he never noticed that this verse 750, your faith has saved you, because we believe that we were saved by faith and faith alone. And uh, he actually, uh, it was a line from Romans that opened up his mind. But when I read that, yes, yeah, saved by faith and faith alone. Okay, um, so we've just had a couple stories uh, that sort of featured um, women, and particularly this one, uh, this sinful woman. And then we have a little brief interlude before we get to the main teaching today, which is a teaching most of you are probably familiar with, the parable of the four soils. But there's a brief little interlude right here. And we're in chat, sorry, good question. We're in Luke chapter 8. And there's a really brief little interlude here, but before we even read this, I just want to submit to you that the society we live in right now, one of the things I think it does very poorly is it holds history and historical people to the same standards of the 21st century. Uh, for example, you know, everybody wants to cancel, I love that word, cancel George Washington and Thomas Jefferson because they were slave owners. And therefore, we sort of, they want to like throw out anything good they did. 
And that kind of misses the main point of history because slavery has been around since the very beginning of mankind. And you'd have to virtually kind of write off everybody in history if that were the case. Does that make sense? And so I'm setting you up for what we're about to read right now. And that is um, looking back through our 21st century eyes on what gets said here in the first few verses of chapter 8. We kind of need to more consider um, what was actually happening around that time. So let's read chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from town, one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. And Susanna. And many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now what I want to point out to you today is how radical that was at the time. Does that make sense? Women weren't accounted for much of anything back then. A rabbi would never stoop to teach a woman. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. Rabbis would not teach women at this time. Now we have Jesus, who people are calling rabbi, and there's this kind of whiff of him perhaps being the Messiah. We, he's now proven in the last story that he's also a prophet. We got a prophet, Messiah, rabbi, and he is counting women in his inner circle. So what I want to point out to you is that was considered radical for the time. So the reason I like to say that is because if, you know, you've all heard the critiques of Christianity that, you know, we're, you know, we all, what's that TV show that they say Christians are like the, where they all wear the bonnet? Anybody? Bueller, Bueller, famous TV show. Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale. No. Handmaid's Tale, where all the women are subjugated and they're only like, you know, good for giving birth or what have you, this and that. And people think, oh, that's what Christianity's like. And they have no idea that Jesus at the time, what's that? Christianians. Christianians, yeah. Christianians. They have no idea that Jesus at the time he was walking around would have been considered a radical, they didn't use the word, but feminist. Does that make sense at the time? And so, like, we look at some of these women who accompanied him. Um, Mary Magdalene, contrary to public opinion, there's no evidence that she was a prostitute or even that she was a woman of loose morals. In fact, this is really only the, the only um, pre-resurrection appearance of Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary Magdalene's going to... Um, um, she's going to feature large in the, in the resurrection story, but it's possible that she was, you know in later years, considered a woman of ill repute because she's not tied to a male, like a husband or a father, but she just sort of appears. And independent women of that time were supposedly of ill repute. In fact, uh, some scholars have looked back and they blame specifically Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century, who preached a sermon um, with the idea that there was two Marys in the Bible, a good Mary, that would be who? Oh. Mother Mary, right? Yeah, the Catholics get it. And a bad Mary, right? But that's just, I'm just letting you know, that's not really true. There's really no historical evidence that this gal, Mary Magdalene, was anything other than a perhaps uh, successful uh, businesswoman or something like that, okay? Then we have um, this gal named Joanna, and I don't know if you read the, between the lines right there, sort of the small print, the wife of who? Who's a great name? But the manager of Herod's household. So her husband is like um, right in the thick of the so-called king of the Jews, Herod, right? She, well, I don't know if she was Roman, but she was probably wealthy and well-connected. Anyways, it's possible that she was a Roman, but we don't, we don't really know that. In fact, I haven't looked into that, but I didn't find any, nobody said that, yeah? Um, and uh, as it turns out, she's going to be one of the women listed at the empty tomb, which kind of makes you wonder, like, she's out running, running around all over the place. But it's just kind of interesting. She's an interesting person. And then we have um, Susanna and many others. Um, Susanna, like Mary, is not listed as being married, um, but you got to love this idea. These women were, and this is really important, they were helping 
to support them out of their own means. That's interesting. These are independent women that seem to have their own finances, and they're probably helping out with everything uh, that is going on, both financially and personal service. So it's interesting that in the context of all of this, Jesus continues to reach out to the poor in spirit, the, um, you know, the lepers, the outcasts, those who are suffering, those who've been abandoned. And it seems to be this clump of independent woman, women that have glommed on to Jesus. He has received them and is teaching them, which no other rabbi would do. And I just want to pause there for a second and say, that's pretty freaking awesome. It's quite interesting at that time that they could earn more than enough to provide for themselves. I know. It is interesting, yeah. And I don't, we don't know exactly. How, I mean, all through the book of Acts, we have a number of um, independent business women that financially support the ministry, yeah. How do they do that while they're following Jesus? That's a really good question, yeah. Well, some of them might have... Um, you know, what do they call it? I don't want to use the word dowry, but, um, you know, you get like a trust or something, you know, where you have, you have steady income. Maybe your family owns land and you get a, a stipend or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly about this, Jesus says he's going around in verse one, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. So remember, the kingdom of God, as we understand it, hasn't necessarily arrived yet. And the disciples aren't proclaiming it yet because Jesus is still teaching them about the kingdom of God and about how one gets into the kingdom of God, which leads us to the parable that we're actually going to cover today. And um, most of you are all familiar with the parable of the four soils. It's virtually identical in three Gospels. It's, uh, it's not in the book of John, but it's virtually identical in um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But what I want to um, show you today, so maybe an avenue you haven't looked at it a little bit, is... Um, when you study a chunk of scripture, you should always go through and look at words that are repeated. Yeah. And so for your benefit, I did the hard work for you because that's why they pay me the big bucks, which is to do the work for you. I went through and highlighted a bunch of verses that go like this. And then let's see if maybe there is a message behind all of this. So like in verse eight, uh, when he said this, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In verse 10, he says, though hearing, they may not understand. In verse 12, he says, those along the path are the ones who hear. In verse 13, um, when they hear it. In verse 14, for those who hear. In verse 15, um, those who hear the word and retain it. Verse 18, therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Wow. Yeah. What do you think is important? Yeah, listening, listening to what Jesus said. Remember, this theme seems to be coming up all the time through the book of Luke. There's the miracles, and everybody's like, wow, look at that. But he's always leading people to listen to what he is saying, okay? So let's listen to what he says. Here's the parable, verses 4 to 8. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path it was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. So it's a parable. Is everybody super familiar with this? Is anybody like, gee, I've never heard this parable before? Okay, I figure you all, if you've read any part of the New Testament, you're probably familiar with this, right? A parable is always like kind of a short story where you connect a truth that most people would be familiar with, and you connect it to a spiritual reality. In fact, uh, a better way to put it is you take a spiritual truth and you connect it to a physical reality so that we would understand it. Um, if you've ever seen me preach, I do it all the time. I tell stories, and then I teach a Bible lesson, and then I go back and I apply the Bible lesson to the story so that we all might walk out of church and go, oh yeah, those Bible passages pertain to my life as well. I always like to give people a warning, though. You don't ever want to um, read too deep into every single word and every single parable, because then you get into, well, what does the moisture represent? And what does you know, what does that represent as if every part of the parable, usually behind every parable is a central 
teaching, and you're better off to just um, focus on that. Okay, so um, it's interesting. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then nobody really seems to say anything uh, from the other um, gospel accounts of this. What happens next is the disciples go away with Jesus, and only when they're alone with Jesus do they, does the story pick up. Verse 9. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, and though hearing they may not understand. Okay, what's going on here? First of all, I find it actually a little comical, because if you notice what happened here, Jesus tells this parable, and he goes, You who have ears, you should hear. And it looks to me like the apostles are like, Yeah. Yeah, and then it's not until they're away from the crowd, somebody goes, hey, uh, Jesus, just in case, you know, Matthew here didn't really understand the parable, maybe you could explain the parable for him. Does that make sense? I think they kind of faked like they knew what the parable was about, but they really didn't have any idea. And they wait till they go aside, which, by the way, it's kind of cool that, like, we get a personal explanation um, from Jesus right now. But it does have this little interesting part about being um, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others, they will, they will see, but not, they, you know, th those seeing, they won't see, though hearing, they may not understand. It's just, a it's just a basic teaching on faith and grace that comes with faith. If you seek God and you are truly humbled and you want to know from God, and you don't have a personal agenda for personal pride or power or money or whatever, then God seems to reveal everything about his kingdom to you, yeah? But for those who are hard-hearted, which is going to get right to the story, the parable that we're getting into right now, they will be forever seeing but never understanding. And the, way, the reason I bring that up to all of you in this room is because, quite frankly, your unbelieving friends sometimes wonder why you waste your time being a Christian. They don't see it. They don't understand. If you've ever, like, said a deep, heartfelt prayer and heard God answer your prayer, you understand these levels of connection with God that your unsaved friends just don't get. Why do you even bother? So let's get to the explanation now of the um, parable. Okay, verse 11 and 12. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God, and those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so they may not believe and be saved. Now, you guys are too young to remember Flip Wilson, but you might remember um, his saying. He used to say, the devil made me do it. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Here's the thing here. I wouldn't give too much credit to the devil here and the enemy. I think it's more because the, the, the deeper teaching of the story is about what you hear, and the heart is sort of your level of understanding. And this seems to be a picture of a hard heart. Um, and this is why. Someone who has a hard heart is exposed and vulnerable to all who oppose the mission of Jesus, whether it be Satan or just simply the world's system. Um, and John MacArthur says, where's Cooper? There he is. That this can be really true of even people who look religious. They have a hard heart, like Judas, yeah. They do religious things, but their hearts are actually far from God. And when the word of God gets preached... It just lays there on top of a hard heart, just the way the word of God would lay, or just the way a seed would lay on a hard road. And then it's vulnerable. Vulnerable to be snatched up by the enemy. Vulnerable to fall for the temptations of the world. It has no salvation. Um, that person has no, um, what's the word I love from the King James? Quickened life. They haven't been, so to speak, resurrected. They haven't been enlivened yet by the Holy Spirit. And so they're vulnerable to every weird teaching of the world and um, the wiles of the enemy. And then you get to verse 13, the rocky soil. Those on the rock are those who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. 
and they believe for a little while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Um, I see a lot of this, unfortunately, and you will too in your life. Um, in my 30-odd years of being a Christian, as being someone involved in church, in my 20-odd, 25 years of being a pastor, and that is that person that shows up to church, maybe they have an emotional experience, they're having a rough time, they hear about God who loves them, they maybe even shed tears of joy, um, they enjoy the fellowship, they like the music, you know, when the girls play, not so much when I play, you know. Uh, they enjoy the good coffee. They even enjoy the feeling of doing good stuff, you know, because let's be honest, it feels good to do good stuff. And I've seen people that show up at church and they get really involved in the whole like, hey, we can like, you know, serve hungry people or what have you. We can wash cars for Jesus or whatever. But then what happens? What does it say here? In a time of testing, all of a sudden the walk with Jesus gets a little hard or it gets a little bit uncomfortable. Somebody, yeah, COVID. Somebody says, oh, you're a Christian. You must hate gays. And they're like, oh, I don't hate anybody. And am I part of a church that hates? This is a true story. We, we don't support gay marriage. Oh, I don't know if I can stand with a church that does that. Or somebody insults your um, potato salad. At, you know, at the potluck, or, you know, you, you donate money, and then the money gets, you, they don't like the way the money gets spent, or whatever, and then eventually, maybe you just sort of get bored with it all, you just, you show up, and one day, oh, it turns out there's a really good football game that day, so you don't go to church that day, and then it just so happens the very next weekend, oh, the surf's really good, and so you, all of a sudden, you're like, oh, yeah, and people are like, hey, man, haven't seen you at church. Yeah, 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 and then what do you hear? I've been busy. Oh, my kids' soccer games are on Sundays now. Really um, hard. Really, it's, yeah, yeah, it's really, I got a story for you. One time, um, this guy, you know, was kind of a cynic. His wife was a believer, and he was kind of cynical. Ah, you Christians, da, da, da. And then he went through a rough patch in his life. And then one day he shows up at church and apparently whatever got preached that day seemed to really like touch him, right? And I love it. What does it say? The ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. And so he's like, I think, I think I'm a believer, da, da, da. I think I'm saved, whatever. And I go, all right. So I took him out to lunch at Brick Oven Pizza up there in Colahale. And I love telling this story because I've never forgotten his exact words because I thought, oh, this isn't going to end well. And I told him as much, yeah? This is what he said. He goes, well, I'm really excited. I really think I'm going to check out Christianity. And this is what he said. I want to see if it works for me. Ooh. Yeah, you see the problem with that statement? To see if it works for me. Somebody tell me, like, what, what did he, how, through what lens was he sort of viewing Skepticism. Christianity? What's that? Skepticism. Skepticism, number one, he wanted, he wanted to, like, test it, see if it worked. Yeah, and go ahead. Uh, yeah, God being his servant, that's part two. And I, I agree with both of you, Kate. See if it was comfortable. Yeah, it's all, we're all rallying around the same idea. Does it help me? I, I would add to it, I would say Christianity as a self-help program. Like, will Christianity help get me off of drugs? Will Christianity help save my marriage? Will Christianity help my teenager from being such a little jerk, right? By the way, all these things I have totally heard from people around the church over my 25 years. Your teenager turns into a jerk. I know what he needs. He needs God. We'll start going to church so the church can straighten out my kid. Or I've never, you know, I've never invested into my marriage. Now my wife is getting ready to leave me. Maybe what we need to do is we need to go to church and see if God will fix our marriage, right? You understand how messed up this all is, right? There's no sense of I'm a sinner that should be burning in hell, but God has forgiven my sins by sending his son, Jesus Christ, that his blood shed on a cross might usher me into the kingdom. Yes. Thank you. Literally, I just had one of my violin teacher who talked, you know, he mm -hmm. brought up that I was religious. We had a conversation. And he's like, well, I tried Christianity and it didn't do anything. I for tried me. Christianity and it didn't and do was, anything and I for was me. Like, no. Like, 
anything for you. Because you wouldn't have this Holy Spirit actually doing anything in your life. And I couldn't agree more. In fact, look, I, I love being part of the church. Don't get me wrong. I think Rusty makes the best latte on the island, and I enjoy the music. But if I thought the church was a self-help program for me, I wouldn't waste another breath. I just wouldn't. I'm such a selfish bastard. I would so much rather be out surfing on Sunday mornings or watching football or sleeping in. There's about, and let, let alone everything else in my life, you know, that I wouldn't be doing if I didn't firmly believe the whole gospel, which I don't need to explain to you guys because I believe you already know that, okay? But these are people that never get any root. They hear it with great joy, but the first little storm that comes, the sun comes out as soon as Christianity becomes remotely uncomfortable, unpopular, or just doesn't work for me, as my one friend said, then they're out of there, okay? The next one is going to also um, ring up a few bells for you. Verse 14, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Now, remember I said at the beginning here, you don't ever want to read too deeply into everything about these parables, right? So I'm going to be a little careful here, but I'm going to like kind of postulate a little bit and tell you what I think a little bit. But just so you know, I can't prove this per se because it's an allegory and it's a parable. But I speculate, and I'm not alone because I read tons of commentators about this exact passage, that these people with the thorns are actual believers. These are saved people that we will be going and seeing them in heaven, right? They are stunted believers but they are believers all the, same, all the same. And by immature fruit, what this means is they don't mature. They don't really bear much good fruit. Um, we would wonder if they're Christian. Yeah, we would even wonder if they're a Christian, and let's hope they are, right? And I would also submit to you, and I can say this to you guys. You know why? Because... I don't mean to blow smoke at you. I don't mean to, you know, feed your egos or anything. But quite frankly, I look at all of you in this room as being the real deal believers. I really do. I think the fact that you, like, sacrificed whatever you sacrificed to come here for a year <laughs> to, to, to sit and listen to people talk about the Bible and Christianity and ethics like you did this morning and whatever and, and, and serve and um, I can speak words to Abba and... Emma, when we go up and we did awkward worship one time together with no sound system, and, and yet you're not like, I'm out of here, you know? Like, you're still trying to do this. I put you guys at the highest level of the faith. Okay, does that make sense? But with that said, quite frankly, when I look out at my congregation on a Sunday morning, I think most of the people that I look out over my congregation are these people. Choked by thorns, I believe... I hope they're saved. I trust they're saved. And sometimes I see a little bit of fruit. By the way, have you ever seen a fruit tree that like, gave crappy fruit? Oh, all the time. Yeah. You have an orchard that's never taken you off. You have an orchard that's never taken off. And you know, you see the fruit. It's kind of like shriveled. And it's supposed, to be like an, it's supposed to be like an apple tree. And you pluck the apple and you try to bite into it. And it's like dust. Right? Yeah. I hate to say it, but unfortunately, I, most Christians I know, that seems to be... Um, their life, right? Um, just never really uh, a lot of fruit. In fact, I thought I had, oh yeah, I did have a story here for you. I want to I share one with you. Uh, this guy by the name of Jim, I don't know if I shared this story with you before, but his wife had always been super pulled in at church. She drove the junior high and high school van for like decades. I'm not kidding, right? She helped out with everything. She helped in the kitchen. And her husband, Jim, was always really cynical and kind of like, and he would come to church maybe three or four times a year. He, um, he was a surf guy that I knew really well from, you know, from the surf life or whatever. And whenever he'd show up at church, can I just do a demonstration of what Jim was like at church? He'd always be kind of like, kind of like this. Yeah, my wife dragged me here. Yeah, and I know you guys, you know. We'd be like, yeah, I'm good to see you. would be like, yeah, 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 I know, I know. You'd be like, I know, I know. I... 
He's just like too cool for school, right? So this goes on, by the way, for like a long time, 15, 20 years, something like that. And then old Jim gets prostate cancer, bad. And the church fully rallies behind him. We hold this big whopping fundraiser down here. We have a giant concert, like 500 people show up and we help the family with finances. All the gals of the church rally around to help with the feeding and everything. And he spirals. It takes him about a year to die, but he spirals. He slowly dies. And he ends up the last maybe month of his life at Wilcox. And every day, the Christians, the family of KCF goes to visit, helps the family, myself included. And here's what he told me about two or, two or three days before he died. And by the way, at this point in the game, like, it's a done deal, right? He's not going to be getting better. And this is what he told me with tears coming down his face. He said, Dane, I blew it. I said, what's that? He goes, all those years, you guys were so nice to me. The church was always so welcoming. And you only wanted what was best for me and my family. And I just completely blew you guys off. I kind of thought you guys were idiots and stupid. He goes, and then I get sick. And what happens? Your whole church, who I dismissed, for 15 years, rallies around me, and I've seen nothing but love and kindness and compassion. And he goes, I blew it. He goes, I could have been a part of you guys. I could have been a part of like God and you guys for the last 15, 20 years, and I just thought I was too cool, and I'm just super. And then he said, would you tell other people that? <laughs> All right? And so I did. That's why I'm still telling the story 15 odd years later or whatever. But it's funny because there's a whole bunch of gyms still at the church, right? I see them almost you know, every Sunday. Not every, not, I don't see the same guys every Sunday because they only come once a month or once every two months. And I want to tell them what Jim told me. Don't wait. Jump in. Be part of the family of Christ. Bear fruit, yeah? Fruit of being involved and, and being a part of. You know when John N. says on Sunday mornings, right before he takes the offering, be part, be part of the family, whether it means giving money or giving your time or giving of yourself. He's basically saying, bear fruit is what John ends is basically saying, right? And this is what I believe Jesus is saying. And so I want to show you one last thing before we wrap up, because I think it comes out a little funny and I want to reverse it. So verse 15, he says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. What do they do? They hear it, they retain it, and by sticking with it, they produce. It's not complicated, people. It's really not. It's not like some great big secret of how to bear fruit as a Christian. Listen to what God says. Pay attention to what God says and do what he's asking you to do. Now, here's, here's what I mean by, I want to switch it around a little bit. When I read this, I'm a bit of a Calvinist. So is Cooper, so he'll agree with me on this. I don't read it so much as, well, good people are the ones that listen to God and do what he says because they're already good, right? I don't, I don't really go with that. What I see it more as is those who hear the word, retain it, persevere and produce a, a crop, become those with the good soil. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, uh, it, it's, it's a full process. In fact, if anything, um, the, the word for perseveres really means patience, steadfast, and obedience, right? Steadfast, patience, and obedience. And um, in, in the book of John, John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus himself says this. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And so I don't look at it as therefore like we're the good people. And of course, the smart people and the good people are those that are the ones that go to heaven. I look at it as the people that just go, yeah, you have, if anything, what do you add to soil to make it a healthy soil? Yeah, yeah. What's fertilizer made out of? <laughs> Poop, right? I honestly think, and, and it really goes well with the idea of being poor in spirit, right? The poor in spirit. Those really who, rich in yeah, those are poor, <laughs> yeah. Poor in spirit, rich in nutrients. Those who are like, I'm a screw up. I'm a mess. Throw away. 
yeah, yeah. I, got, I, bring, I bring nothing. I need help. That's fertile soil for, to, for someone to listen. Then you hear the good news of your salvation and you reach for it and you cling for it. And what you're really hoping for is to be saved, to, to be welcomed into the kingdom. And by the way, is it possible that at that point, yeah, God might save your marriage or get you off of drugs or, you know, help your mental state? Yeah, it's possible. But those are outcomes. Those are the outcomes of the root of salvation, which comes from what we just heard. Those who hear, who have soil that is churned up and nutrient rich. Yeah? And then we'll wrap up the last couple of verses today, and we can uh, maybe have discussion or just wrap it up. Okay, verse 16. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, and here it is. This is like, therefore, what's the there, therefore, therefore? Consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken from him. Wow. What an interesting little concept on the end of that. So he talks about four soils. Obviously, you all want to be part of that last one, the good heart, the good soil, right? Whatever. But then Jesus is going to leave, right? He's going away just like a year or so. He's going to be gone. And then it's going to be up to these apostles, disciples, and the women that we talked about here at the beginning of chapter 8 to bear fruit. And he's basically saying, let your fruit be your light, yeah, and take this message to the world, and the fruit you bear will disclose who you really are. Because obedience will bear fruit, and someday it will all be revealed. And then, um, I'm not exactly sure what to make about that last bit about um, um, whoever has will be given more, whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has <laughs> will be taken away. They could be talking about the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel was blessed with the Messiah, but the nation of Israel is going to reject the Messiah, yeah? Uh, and they're going to lose everything. Um, or you might be also talking about the one who finds joy um, in Jesus and the church. Those who have great joy in finding Jesus, their joy will be compounded. And even those who think they had a little bit of joy um, will lose it completely, going back to the one who um, heard for who received the word with joy, but then lost it, right? Okay. Uh, you guys have any questions or comments on any of this? It's all about hearing. And yeah. How you hear. And how you hear. Let me, let me give you another funny example. One time I was preaching on, I was preaching through the book of Exodus, and I was um, doing the Ten Commandments. You all know the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not steal was one of the commandments, okay? So I taught for, I don't know, five minutes on what does it mean, thou shalt not steal. And there's these elements of, like, free will. There's elements of God honoring personal property, and when I was done preaching, this guy, who I hadn't seen around very much, comes up to me, and this is what he says. He goes, so if I'm hearing what you said correctly, he said, what you're telling me is, if somebody votes for Obama, knowing that voting for Obama will continue to get him more welfare checks, then that's stealing. Yeah, anybody? Bueller? I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, so what you're saying is then he repeated what, he just, what I just said. And I was like, okay, first of all, no. <laughs> That's not remotely what I said, right? But you see what's happening right there? Basically what happened to this guy was he showed up at church with some kind of political agenda. I think to him, Jesus was a Republican. Does that make sense? Yeah. And he came to hear a political message. And guess what he heard? A political message. I would put his heart as being hard at best. <laughs> well, maybe not. No, maybe at best he would have had um, rocky soil, right? But most likely hard. I don't think he heard a word of what Jesus was actually trying to talk to him about 
through the book of Exodus. Does that make sense? Right? So when, <laughs> have you ever had somebody poke you during a sermon and go, this is all about you, you know? <laughs> have you ever done that to your spouse? <laughs> My spouse and I have done that. We were like poking each other. He's talking about you. Yeah. Something else that's always, I, the lamp just seems like out of place. Mm -hmm. It will be revealed where our hearts are. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, by the way, speaking of the lamp, this is just kind of a side topic on this. But in the world we live in today, there's a weird little th saying that gets tossed around. You might have heard, well, my beliefs are very personal to me. <laughs> we hear that all the time. Uh, I just want you to know, for Christian, that's never the case. Our beliefs are not just personal for us, especially if you look at the commandment that Jesus is telling us. He's telling us, take this message to the world. Tell everybody what you believe. And by the way, one of the great things for you guys to be figuring out while you're here at Anchor House, and, and to be quite honest with you, is one of the main motivators I had when I went to Cape and Ray for a year, 20, uh, 30 odd years ago was I wanted to know exactly what it is I do believe. Does that make sense? So that if anybody was to ever ask me, believer or unbeliever, to explain why I believe what I believe, I would have reasons for it. I mean, what does uh, Peter say? Be prepared at all times to give reason for the hope that is within you, right? And then speak that truth, he says, in love with great humility. Speak that truth in love, right? And so just so you know, um, I, that would be almost fun to have someone tell me, like, well, my, my beliefs are very personal. Say, well, why is that? <laughs> why are your beliefs so secretive and private? I'd like to hear what they are. Is it okay? And um, this, maybe, I, well, I'm, I'm going way down a tangent, but to wrap up one last thought, uh, because it came up yesterday with a friend, a really good story, actually, a guy that I shared Christ with about uh, 10 years ago, finally came to faith about... Um, six months ago and he's here visiting on the island and we were laughing about how the la last time we'd had coffee together at Living Foods and I was sharing Christ with him and he was arguing with me. <laughs> he wasn't really arguing with me, but he was that guy that everything I told him about Jesus, he would twist into a new age thing, you know, and the universe, you know, and all that. And then, uh, and I said, okay, but I, I continue to talk to him and send him books and we traded texts and emails over the last 10 years and about six months ago, he lives in uh, San Diego. He fully received Christ, and he's totally on fire for Christ. Yeah, super, super, super good story um, there. Um, but we were talking about ways to share Christ, and one way you can do that that a lot of people don't think about, oh, because the, the topic of apologetics came up. And a lot of um, apologetics is about when people question your Christian faith. But one thing you should always remember um, if you get into sharing Christ with people is ask them what they believe. And one of the reasons I, I tell you to do that is you'd be surprised how thin most people's sort of self-created theology is. If they even have one, yeah. Because if someone were to ask you, well, what's the price for getting into heaven? And how do you know that there is a God? And what happens when you die? And where did we come from? And, you know, and how do we know, you know good from evil? Well, I, I would hope that you would all have answers for all of that. That would come straight out of the Bible. But you'd be surprised how many people are out there running around thinking that I have this personal secret of faith. But they really have, they can't answer any of those questions, where we came from and what happens when we die. And who's in and who's out and by what scale. And if there's good and evil, then how do, you know, is there judgment and how do you, Get, get out from under it. Okay, I've talked too long. We're over out of time. Let's wrap up in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your word, Lord, and thank you for um, this time of being here and talking about you and um, the truths that we get to enjoy from you. And so, Father, I, I just pray for a great lunch for everybody right now and um, that everybody comes back for the second part of the teaching today, all fired up and maybe caffeinated and ready to hear more from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.